short intro about Francesco with really great experience, very impressive, especially in agile transformation. Uh, he's uh, presenting now unique credit holding, yes, uh, not only some concrete direction, but who holding. Uh, Nika, maybe you will help me add some uh, words about Francesco. Because I mean, firstly, firstly, it's great to see Francesco live again. Uh, we worked together uh, back uh, many years ago. And then he was uh, one of the most active and inspiring guys I've met uh, while working at Unicredit and we remained friends and uh, good, good to have him on this conference. Francesco has various experiences starting from uh, business, uh, finance, uh, going on to organizational transformation and finally now tackling huge agile topics in a group. By the way, I don't know how much the audience knows Unicredit in a group, which is huge. It's, it's the, yeah. I guess, the biggest bank, uh, banking conglomerate in, Ru in Europe in terms of size of the subsidiaries and, and the people. So basically, uh, and then tackling Agile there in a mentality where, where it's quite a legacy mentality, I would say, because it's a traditional banking institution, is a big challenge. So Francesco, tell us more about this. How are you doing in that? Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks for the nice introduction. So uh, what I wanted to do today is to bring you possibly a different perspective from what I sense the previous uh, presenters and previous speakers uh, did. Uh, by the way, I know Andrea very well. He has a compelling experience as well. And we uh, talked together a lot when I started my first uh, journey with Agile at Unicredit. Uh, indeed, the title is Less is More. Why? Because uh, I want to share one main message that uh, if you take Agile, even with the biggest enthusiasm you have, there are probably few things that uh, A, make the biggest difference and B, they are sufficient to have already an in, an, a significant uh, pickup uh, even in a company that needs to face uh, uh, legacy for some time or the complexity of a large international organization. So let me start and if we, if we move to the uh, next uh, slide, I think we can be quick on Unicredit. Indeed, as uh, Nick said, we are a large, large European banking institution. We are basically a commercial bank with a very strong uh, um, corporate investment banking. We are in uh, 13 core markets where our presence is uh, uh, serious, so we, we are often number one or number two, um, but we are also present worldwide. We can move to the, to the next slide. Our business mix uh, in terms of revenues, uh, uh, in terms of footprint, uh, in terms of employees is the typical one of uh, a diversified commercial bank. We have a predominant uh, uh, presence in relative terms in Italy, but I think uh, a long time ago, we stopped being uh, an Italian group uh, in favor of a pan-European one. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I spent most of my uh, career abroad, as a matter of fact, uh, and not in Italy. Moving to the next one, um, and we can move to even the next one. So slide number five, I want to start talking about, uh, we, we can actually go through uh, uh, the next bullet. So a couple of clicks more. So what are the typical problems that uh, a company like us have, has? And, and I think it may be also a problem that you guys have. So first of all, you have uh, an IT architecture you have to either cope with or you have the luxury to be uh, leveraging on. But in general, large companies have uh, to uh, stick to legacy and balance legacy with uh, what's new, the last mile, front end, things that are typically uh, agile by nature or faster. Uh, but you can't dismiss uh, neither of the two, you have to make them work together. Uh, then you have another problem that is, uh, how do you make uh, a complex group uh, where potentially you have uh, uh, one country where you are very much on growing the landing side uh, with another one that uh, wants actually to increase deposit gathering. One very strong on fee business uh, with one where actually the business model is more traditional. Uh, and how do you make something that works for everyone? And the third one is uh, in a large group, in a large institution, 
how do you understand uh, what uh, your users are going to adopt uh, equally in different countries as opposed to those that are extremely specific now uh, nick and i are old friends eh? i'm sure that there are things that we do exactly the same way when we use some of uh, services that are now you know mainstream globally but there are a lot of things that i saw nick doing very first and i learned later on so we are also very different so my main learning in all these years is that uh, in a large organization and in general you can't decide between uh, convergency or independence you can't decide between legacy and uh, the forefront of uh, technology you can't uh, make everybody happy or nobody you actually have to balance and the reason why i was asked to start agile in the group is because the process of balancing was simply too long it was simply too long to get uh, decisions uh, and execution quick in a group where fairly people and customers may have a different perspective but yet you make synergies when some of these decisions are common and so i was asked i was having a different responsibility and i was asked to start uh, agile up in uh, uh, back then central eastern europe moving to the next uh, slide and uh, in fact uh, i needed to find a way to on one end uh, accelerate uh, uh, typical digital developments in single projects, but at the same time facilitate uh, the developments of uh, a divisional program that was the development of mobile, where we were simply too slow to cope with the competitors that had the speed of a single country, uh, a single country, uh, let's say, uh, presence as opposed to ours. And so we, we had to find a way to make uh, mobile uh, faster. Now, uh, I happened to participate to the, to the conference this morning here and there, and I happened to hear someone saying, uh, you can't afford to deliver every three months, it's too slow. And I agree. But uh, what if your starting point is that uh, you actually have uh, one delivery common to all the countries you are present, once per year or once every nine months. And so what did we do? We actually created a framework, a framework that uh, helps, uh, helped back then uh, mobile to deliver every quarter with no delays in every country, chipping any delay to decisions and executions uh, that uh, could uh, endanger the fact that our customers in all the countries could have something new on our mobile mobile app every three months, no matter what. Then we had, uh, once this uh, became uh, a practice, so we sort of developed the, the muscle of going for a quarterly base, we decided to explore the possibility to go for an organizational agile operating model. And uh, uh, I can make, uh, I, I can be very transparent with you. Myself, I was inspired by ING. I visited ING, so I, I know very well what I and Andrea presented back then. And here the idea was to apply Agile to the full end, to the point that we would even formally reorganize one of our banks. So we actually reorganized the bank into, we didn't call them tribes, but domains, and we could distribute IT in a way that every tribe or every domain would have a dedicated IT so that uh, each of them could be independent or fairly independent one another. Of course, when we went from uh, mobile agility in Central and Eastern Europe to um, an agile organization, we needed to tackle uh, enablers that were not important in the first wave in 2016, like uh, how we could redesign them and how we would redesign the HR framework and we designed for an organizational change. Then we decided to uh, step into Western Europe and myself, I moved from Central Eastern Europe to Western Europe, where the magnitude of the bank is way bigger and where the effort of a full organizational change would be too big. And we basically apply some of the principles in developing what we call uh, uh, now end-to-end -end permanent rooms, uh, where basically we created multidisciplinary teams where business and IT sit together deliver on a regular basis over identified business areas 
they have one backlog, they have identified KPIs. We did review also here demand, HR framework, uh, and, and uh, funding to these initiatives. We also uh, uh, created a customer experience uh, competence center with a program that we call the Net Promoter System Program, which I also had in order to steer this program around customers. And the difference between what we wanted to do in 2018 and 2019 is, uh, if I can summarize, that we didn't go for an organizational change. So people belong to their formal organization, although working into a permanent cross-functional uh, setup. Moving to the next slide, what is common of uh, any of the three initiatives and what actually became my main, uh, my main point. Inga, if we could move to the, to the next one. What is common is that, uh, number one, you design around customer needs. So you identify what are the needs that you want to serve and you drop, no, no, the previous one and you drop from customer needs down to your IT architecture and processes so that you create consistency between the responsibility in terms of needs you serve and the responsibility of the IT assets and processes that you are also responsible for. Without this consistency, you are creating a fragmentation of decisions that will not get any of the models work. This is, of course, my experience. The second is that we needed to create uh, stable staffing. So regardless of being uh, the organizational change formal or not, uh, you need to know who is working with whom and you need to protect stability of that. Even if you have a lot of externals, as in some of our banks we still have, so we are where ING was, you need the people to work together and bond together. And you need to create systems by which you safeguard business IT control functions alignment across the different rooms, across the different tribes. Because when you create any tribe, any room, as in a functional organization, people start developing silos by nature. It's very normal. And because they create their identity, so you need to have a transversal alignment anyway. And we were building this across the shared IT services and control functions. Now I would move to the, the main learnings and uh, the first one in the next slide is that it takes time, especially in a large organization. And if I can summarize uh, the, the, the first three steps uh, in order to create a pace, I would say the first step is to, create, to get the room right or to get your agile perimeter right. So spend a bit of time, we spent a bit of time in defining the proper set of needs, architecture, processes, and people that need to be together for some time. Then you need to spend some time to get people together. Now we found out that through COVID, virtually together is good, but we have to design some face-to-face -face get together as well. Think about, for those of you that had an MBA, an MBA actually make people become friends for, for life, but I think it's because sometimes they have met, sat together physically and created a bond. If this happens, they don't have to be together all the time. It can be one week or two every three months. And the final one is uh, get room delivery right. So you need to protect uh, your agile uh, initiative for some time to find a pace. Everyone has one pace to start with. So we avoided to push a pace we had in mind originally. So the famous three months were the ones that we have defined bottom up. And then the right pace is the one where the mortality of uh, deliveries that uh, the rooms want to have uh, against the ones that they actually have becomes very low. And the room feels like now going for an increasing speed. But at the beginning, you have to set the, you have to let the room define its own pace. Less is more, next slide. And this is uh, about to be concluding. So what I think is the things that uh, I would never miss and I would ever insist, no matter whether we go for a recipe A, B, C, whenever we go for full-fledged ING wide or ING like or something smaller. One, people need to align around something. 
and they need to do it also on the, uh, let's say, operational level, for me, this is one backlog. There is one backlog, there is one list of things that are prioritized, we look at regularly. It can be a strategic one, drill down at a more operational one, down, down to the daily tasks. But that's what makes people talk one thing and one language. The second is uh, spend, and we spend time in simplify accountability. So you need to have a few clear roles for decision making, very few, very, very few. The product owner is for me the, 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 main, uh, the main case. And then uh, you need to have a team that is co-responsible for uh, uh, developing things, shipping things to customers. We do not want to underestimate, it happened in the past, the importance of someone that takes care of the people and take care of the process. This is the coach. And last, design for speed. So have someone, this is my role in the organization that is like uh, attacking whatever is uh, making things slow. Of course, this is a long journey. So we are slower than other organizations, but uh, just applying these few things, we are way faster than we were some time ago. And I can tell you that this has been impressive, impressive a, a lot. Uh, I see some questions. So if you don't mind, I will just conclude and, and answer at the end. Uh, I'm about to finish. So in the next slide, the less is more of the previous slide is, in my opinion, the must have. These other three are things that uh, if you have them, you go from uh, uh, a very, very good uh, start to something that is making things really work. One is uh, get your sponsors in. They need to be with you. They need to be in the room. They need to be with people. They need to get their hands into the life of rooms because this gives uh, a bit of pressure, but it's a very healthy one. Of course, this is where the mindset of sponsors makes difference. And in our case, they have been terrific in supporting the end-to-end -to, -end to go and to start well. Collocation, collocation, in my opinion, will stay important. It can be remote collocation for some time, but we need to make people like in this call, see each other, talk to each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, uh, certainly, whenever you can redesign funding in a sort of uh, startup fashion, so you have uh, uh, a rolling funding that is given based on uh, the growth of your initiative, not based on uh, business cases. And whenever this funding is more driven by, if you, if you talk to any funder, they, they do look at your plans, but they have also, they rely on the feeling that you are the right people and you have a lot of, uh, you know, they give a lot of credit to the speed of what you do. So I think uh, it's a, a simplified decision taking, but it's uh, rolling and it's for much smaller chunk of money at the time. So that, that's what I would always push for. And we are working in that direction at Unicredit for the end to end. And uh, lessons learned. What worked for me, what didn't work and we had to uh, work on. And I think I will stay in one minute. It, what worked very well, last slide, is uh, even if we did uh, gradual agile, differently from other speakers, I found so tremendous impact that I would, uh, I would uh, not fight for a full-fledged organization, uh, but anything that is incremental, even in uh, making agile at scale. Uh, I think it's super important that business and IT are together. You don't have a better and a worse son. They are both equal in this. It's a business and IT story. Uh, again, the backlog. The backlog is your list and is what you all work for. Attention. Without it, it's harder. Without sponsorship, it's harder. We need to invest in few roles indeed. And... Uh, People need to accept the fact that the resources are scarcer in terms of money and time. That's what makes velocity eventually. What I would avoid, because in my experience it doesn't work, I would just touch the first point, language. In my experience, I, I'm not a, a, an agile practitioner by story. I, I don't come from, uh, you know, I didn't write the manifesto and uh, I, I am an enthusiast of agile. And uh, um, for me, this was like uh, an eye-opening thing. But part of the language that we use and part of the language that the agile practitioners use often actually does not speak with the organizations we want to change. So be careful with uh, uh, some of the language. Uh, you will see that they don't speak to people as much as they speak to you. 
my, my suggestion is get rid of the language if this is not making people closer for some time. Sooner or later, they will ask to talk your language. And I think I can stop here and I would be super happy to go through any question. Uh, thank you, Francesco.